Hi, my name is Krista. I am in your EDSE 619 class, and I will be discussing, or summarizing rather, um, chapter 11 in B.F. Skinner's book about behaviorism. Um, chapter 7 is all about the self and others, and he starts the chapter off by talking about the effects of personality on an individual's behavior um, and how complex contingencies create complex behavioral repertoires. So what does that mean? Basically, that means that different contingencies and different situations that an individual is put in brings out the different facets of that individual's personality. Um, and that an individual's personality can adapt and change dependent upon the situation that they are in. Um, I think the big idea of the, the, this beginning of chapter 11 is that a person is not an originating agent. Um, this is a quote from the book. He's a locus, and many genetic and environmental conditions come together in a joint effect. So the way I interpreted that is that no one has the same personal history, as he also stated in the book, um, and that no one is going to behave in quite the same way, um, you know, in, in, ver in those various situations, how I might react might be completely different by how, you know, my sister or my boyfriend or my parents react in various situations. Um, and he goes on to talk about how all species have a pattern of behavior without knowing it. And that man is the only species that consciously discusses those patterns of behavior and, and has created descriptive behavior terms. Um, and it, he talks about, B.F. Skinner goes on and talks about how communities have generated various ways of describing themselves, how individuals in a community describe themselves. Um, and, you know, basic kind of terms, this is, I think, introvert, extrovert, you know, people can describe themselves as very outgoing, the life of the party, and uh, while other individuals are, you know, more interdirected, introspective, um, they're a little bit quieter and a little bit more withdrawn than, say, an extrovert who is that life of the party. Um, he then poses, I think, a good point that mentalistic psychologists produce, the questions that are asked by mentalistic psychologists produce a different type of self-knowledge and self-awareness than an existentialist or a humanistic psychologist does. Um, he, in, later on in the chapter, he states that psychoanalysts give a person a clear image of themselves and encourages an individual to explore their feelings and their self-awareness, their self-knowledge. Um, and that leads to insight on their behavior and you know, their, how the personality is affecting the behavior, um, or how the behavior is affecting the personality, rather, I said that backwards. Um, and another, I think, really good, uh, big point, big idea that he brought up is that those changes in the contingencies and the changes in the behavioral repertoires can be difficult for an individual to maintain their sense of identity in the in during those condition changes and that can lead to an identity crisis not really feeling like you know yourself not really feeling like you have a grasp on what is going on um, and people often ask you know how do you feel rather than why do you feel that way because it's easier to answer a question about how you feel than why do you feel that way I know myself, I would rather tell you that I'm having a bad day than go into full, you know, description of why my day is bad. Some people might not care. Um, so further in the chapter, he talks about the importance of examining the reasons for one's own behaviors as carefully as possible because understanding our own behavior enables us to better understand the behavior of others. Um, and I think here, Empathy is a good example because, um, you know, why we may not entirely understand what another person is going through or, or what another person is feeling, we have ha probably had a lot of similar emotions 
So, you know, we can try to understand as closely as possible um, and just have empathy for people. Um, I, I think another really good example that he goes on to talk about, and I want to read this passage out of the book, um, says, we understand another person in part from his expression of feelings. Actors were once said to be able to register joy, sorrow, and so on with facial expressions, postures, and movements. And the audience read these expressions and hence understood the characters and their motives, presumably because it had learned to do so in real life with real people. So I think a couple of really good examples um, for that specific passage is Tom Hanks and Forrest Gump and Leonardo DiCaprio in a movie called What's Eating Gilbert Grape. Um, both individuals, Tom Hanks and Leonardo DiCaprio, played individuals that could have been on the autism spectrum. And, you know, we all know that Tom, we're all familiar with Tom Hanks and Leonardo DiCaprio, and we both know that neither of them, as real people outside of their um, various um, parts that they have played, are not on the autism spectrum. And both of them I've seen in interviews where they studied the behavior and the mannerisms of that pe in real people that are um, on the autism spectrum to best be able to convey those emotions and those meanings behind a lot of the things that they go through as characters. Um, and I think that, you know, there's, while these actors are not experiencing that specific emotion, in that moment in time, they do a really good way, like Skinner said, in their um, their postures, their movements, their um, facial expressions, the intonation in their voice, conveying those emotions to us as the audience. Um, you know, we are also not feeling those emotions in the moment, but we have, everyone has felt a lot of the emotions in the movie, at some point or another and the more convincing that an actor is in their part and conveying those emotions the more under the more understanding the audience is going to have as to what that character is going through um you know kind of just summing up the chapter uh he talks skinner talks about how when people began to better understand why others behaved the way that they did, a different type of self-knowledge arose. Um, he says that this new self-knowledge took genetic and environmental history, as well as current settings and situations into account when explaining behavioral repertoires and contingencies. Um, and I think that's really important because it's not a cut and dry black or white situation with people's behavior. And, you know, you do have to take into account the genetics, the environmental um, history of individuals and the settings and situations because, like I said at the, the beginning of the video, um, the, the setting and situation, individuals adapt their behavior and their personality to those settings and situations. So how you would act with one group of friends or your parents might not be how you act around another group of friends or your boyfriend or your best friends or something. So, you know, you, you, um, I never really thought about it in this way, but you really do adapt your personality, the way that you behave, the way that you carry yourself based on the various situations and settings that you are in. And I think that was a really big point of this chapter this week. Um, so my question to y'all is, what impact does behavior have on an individual's personality? And why do you think different contingencies bring out different facets of an individual's personality? I can't wait to read your responses in the discussion forum. And I hope that you enjoyed this week's video. Thanks for watching.